Okay. Welcome all. This is the third meeting Welcome on all. This is mental the third health meeting. support for our healthcare workforce. Um, thank you, whoever just muted your phone right now. This is all about the group helping one another, and we appreciate your support in the technical pieces as well as we all figure out how to work from home or work differently in this time, just as our colleagues um, out in the healthcare front lines are doing as well. Um, I'm Tani Hemela with ICSI and I'm the director of the Minnesota Health Collaborative. Um, other members of the ICSI team are here today who will um, help facilitate at different points. We have Jody Dvorkin joining, monitoring the chat. Um, and so as you have questions along the way, feel free to also put them in chat. Um, Sarah Horst, my colleague, will join um, to tee up the conversation with a bit of framing that helps us think about um, our work going forward. We're really excited that you are all here. Um, a reminder, a housekeeping reminder um, to mute your phones when you're not speaking, unmute when you want to speak because we want to hear your voices, uh, and that we all remind ourselves of antitrust and not um, venture into financial matters that we shouldn't. So we all have that responsibility as a group. Uh, so, with that, a little bit of level setting about how we got here. So this is the third of three weekly meetings, three weekly conversations that really stemmed from our mental health working groups at ICSI, um, where when we put out the call and said, you know, you all are connected to one another. How do you see using ICSI, the ICSI network, and some time um, to support one another and healthcare in general? And uh, the idea arose to meet on this as all of you are preparing to and are responding to your workforce's um, wellness needs, mental health needs, in addition to safety, PPE, et cetera, um, having some time to share those practices around mental health support for the workforce and was identified as valuable. The first two discussions, the last two weeks, were broad. It was, here's the issues we're seeing, here's what we're planning to do. And there was really generous sharing um, from many organizations. Um, because of that, we were able to start and populate a website very quickly to curate what you have provided and shared with one another. Um, and we'll talk more about that at the end of this meeting. So really, this is a really good example of the collaborative healthcare community that we have here in Minnesota that takes action quickly, comes around um, and galvanizes to support um, and provide that support as needed. So from those first two conversations, one of the topics that arose was the use of employee assistance programs at this time. And we had some discussion last week. Some of you were there or may have seen the meeting notes of that. Um, and so we wanted to take a deeper dive. We've got several folks today from Alina, from Mayo, and also from Center Care who have offered to help start the conversation and will want to hear from all of you as well. So before we go forward, anything on chat that I need to know of? Um, somebody from the IT team? I'm Going to check quickly. I'm seeing a lot of introductions, so that's good. Go ahead, Tani. It's Jody. Okay. Thank you, Jody. Great. So, before we leap into EAP, what we've been talking about as ICSI is that here we are in this time, all of us needing to totally change our lives at a moment's notice because of COVID. Well, maybe we had some warning, but still, that change has been needed and it continues. Um, and, and so, um, the, the thing that it come to mind and came out in a team meeting yesterday was, it's kind of like back, um, in the time of, you know, I remember in grade school learning about in the event of fire, what to do, you stop, drop, and you roll. And in this time, in a crisis, it's really easy for us to like, quick, let's do something. Let's throw something at this fire. This is a time and a place where we stop for a moment, kind of stop, drop, and think. We're gonna think first about what it is we're doing, even as we're acting quickly, and you all are. So this is a moment to think. Um, and so before we get to EAPs and to support that conversation, um, we've asked Sarah Horst, our, 
our resident improvement expert, um, to speak a little bit about thoughtful decision making. Sarah? Yes, let me uh, pull up. I have a PowerPoint, I hope works. Uh, let's see how do that. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Horst from ICSI. And one of my roles at ICSI is to do uh, what we call capacity building. Um, when the very smart people we work with know what they want to do or what outcome they desire, um, I often will come in and partner with them um, to think about how to get the work done. They know the what, but the how is difficult. And so uh, what I want to do today is just provide what I'm going to call food for thoughtful decision making. Uh, and our topic is good questions for solving the right problems. It's going to be about five minutes. Um, and what we're going to do is review a couple frameworks um, and um, think about some skills that could help us go further uh, faster. As Tani mentioned, um, we're in a crisis right now. And um, a lot of us are in kind of firefighter mode where we're going to throw some solutions at problems. Um, and when many of us, I know I do, when I want to have a sense of control, um, things often become binary. Um, things are good or bad. They are black and white. I've got a right solution or a wrong solution. Just tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. Uh, and I need to do it fast because I've got 10 other things to do. And so um, as we stop and are thoughtful and reflective, um, I just want to affirm um, that we are in uncharted territory um, where things aren't black and white. And we need to really embrace that gray. Um, and um, what we need to do is be more improvisational, flexible, agile, nimble. Um, and as we select solutions, um, want to just have permission that there are very likely many solutions that are good ones. And so taking the pressure off of finding that one perfect solution. Um, and as I, I, and when we do that, we want to ask really good questions. So um, what I'm struck with, you know, ICSI, um, at our core, we are, we use evidence-based solutions to do improvement, and we are a quality improvement organization. And as I'm listening to my friends and people and watching all of us, um, I'm really struck by the fact that um, as much as things feel really out of control, where every day is different, where there's new data coming in, new information, we tried something, it didn't work, I'm really struck by the fact um, that we are using um, quality improvement. Um, and so in our pause, it may feel chaotic, um, we want to really, you know, maybe our, our urge to do some emotional problem solving or reacting. Um, I think we can really look and see that in improvement science, um, there is more method than we realize. And so I'm going to talk today about improvement science and just some really quick um, concepts on design. These may be familiar to you. Um, but again, food for thought and maybe just time to rem be, remember, we have some good fundamental tools um, that we can use. And so just a review of basic improvement science, so many of our organizations rely on the model for improvement, which was born out of the improvement guide um, by Langley Nolan. And it says that for any problem we have, uh, any improvement we wanna do, um, we can really um, get to the solving of it um, through asking and applying three simple questions. And the questions are on your screen. Number one, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, number two, what change could we make that will result in the improvement? And then asking how will we know that change is an improvement? Um, and then we move those hypotheses into small tests of change. I had a friend working in, a, in one of the central labs at one of your organizations, and she's just like, it's different every single day. And we tried this and it didn't work. So we did this and then it worked and blah, 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 blah. And then now I've talked to her and she's like, it feels pretty good. It feels more stable. And what's happening is we, are, we have our aim, we know what we wanna do, um, and then we're throwing hypotheses here. What changes can we make? And then maybe four, five, six, seven, and we put them into small iterative tests of change that you may know as plan, do, study, act cycles, or PDSAs. And as we test those, we are testing and learning and applying knowledge. And we do that through saying, what would I adopt that works? What would I adapt? Or what would I abandon? So as much as things feel chaotic, if you find yourself with a problem to solve, trying new things, and based on what you learn, doing something different the next day, you're using more science than you may realize. Trying to move forward. And so that gets us really to, we wanna pause and say, what problem are we trying to 
solve. Um, and in our crisis uh, mode, and you know, I call it putting on our firefighter hat, throwing something there, um, acknowledging that there may be more than one solution. Um, we wanna just give you a quick framework that may be helpful for you if you're not using it already. And that's a framework from design thinking. Um, and so I always show this, um, this, is a, this is my drawing. This is me, I'm five foot two at a grocery store and reaching, I climb the shelves um, to get sugar because I am a normal sized person, it's above, I have to reach up there. So I'll ask you to think silently, what does this woman need? And then I'll say, how many of you think she needs a ladder or a reachy grabby thing or a step stool? And some of you will think that's a solution. And then I'll say, how many of you think she needs sugar? And as we think about framing, um, so often um, we think of these store shelves as our history and the way we've done things. And because we do things this way and we have shelves, then we'll just give a solution to op continue operating the way we always operate. But as we're learning now more than ever, and um, how are we getting our sugar right now? We're not climbing shelves and many of us aren't going to stores. I'm ordering off of online and I'm having it delivered. Or an Amazon will say, how do we put an easy button in? And so what we're doing is we're thinking about what, what problem are we really solving here? What does this woman need? Not how can we retain the status quo? How can we do what we've always done? But we're really thinking about what experience are we trying to create for this woman? And ultimately, how can we make it easier for her to do this? So with that, we like to play the game called Crazy Aids. Or we, we run most projects through an exercise and this we find really helpful. We ask the question, who needs a way to do what because why? So we might say this woman needs a ladder to reach the sugar because it's out of reach. Um, we ask this question eight times because inevitably for the first three times, three, four times you ask, you're gonna maintain the status quo of how we've always done it or it's gonna be just because, because you need to comply. And once you get that out of your system, six, seven, and eight, you start releasing yourself of that and thinking, gosh, she really just does need sugar. What's the easiest way we could get that? Or actually, maybe she doesn't even sugar. Maybe she needs brownies and she's going to bake them. But maybe there's a way we could just get her brownies. And so I'd encourage you, if you are finding yourself in crisis mode, throwing problems at the old, throwing solutions at the old problems, this is a really helpful thing to do. Who needs a way to do what because why? And challenge yourself on your assumptions of who, what, and why. We did this at ICSI with a group of many organizations in the Twin Cities on opioids, and I'll show you kind of how that worked, and we reframed it. So your initial thing, uh, many of us go from a blame. So for uh, we wanted to um, talk about how to reduce opioid prescribing and make it be more, um, more thought, just reduce the amount of opioids we prescribe. So generally, we might start from a place of blame. That's how can we get providers to prescribe less, you naughty, naughty providers. Um, and when we asked who needs a way to do what because why, we got to a really humble place, um, thinking about the experience we wanted to create for providers, thinking about how we could make it easier, to a place of empathy and support. And how could we make it easier for providers to find options other than opioids? And when we did this, um, this was our thoughtful problem statement, which just really kind of blew our minds because the initial conversation was so like, ah, you know, let's just tell them. And it went to providers need a way to assess whether chronic opioids are appropriate because otherwise we risk taking away help for those who need it and are offering the wrong treatment for those who are not good candidates and are suffering from issues not related to physical pain. Now, I realize we're not talking about opioids today as we think about mental health for COVID, but wanted to present this as it, it a lot, these eight questions, um, asking eight times with a group radically changed our thinking about what problem we were trying to solve and how we were approaching it. Um, and so we went from our old conversation, kind of the selling and telling of, hey, prescribe differently, follow this rule, which might be a typical thing. And as we're thinking about EAP and we're thinking, you know, is this the right solution and how I can get it out there? Um, the solution might be just tell people and train people to go there. Um, but a design approach might change that. And in our new conversation, it's how could we make it easier? And that led us to get more creative on tools. Um, so for opioids, we developed tools for assessment, tapering, optimizing the EMR, um, and making it easier to prescribe appropriately. So food for thought for that. And so why we're doing this at the beginning of this meeting is we really just, um, what we're trying to do is provide, uh, get you all together and create a knowledge community um, where you can use data and information to apply your knowledge and gain wisdom. 
um, we've been asked by some, could you curate best practice? Um, and frankly, no, uh, because in this time, um, what's best for one organization may not be best for the other. And what we want to do is put forward our best thinking in conversation and in co collaboration. And we want, we want to provide you some guidance on what questions you should be asking um, so that together we can create the space for something to emerge and for you to help um, surface what's best for your organization. And so some thoughtful questions to leave you with as you hear the next presentations um, and you're thinking, think about what is EAP solving for you? Um, is it one of the right solutions? So the challenge for you, um, for all of us, is what experience are we trying to create? Who needs a way to do what because why? How can we make it easier to achieve that experience? How can we be empathetic? Um, and then ultimately, um, how do we understand if we're pursuing the right solution? So that's our food for thought for today. Thank you. If you have questions, that's my email. I'd love to hear from you, but I'll turn it back over to Tawny. Thank you, Sarah. Much appreciated. Um, and so as we, um, today we are focusing on, um, let's see, we're gonna get our technology going first here. So we're going to um, use that framework as we think about, we've got existing perhaps EAPs that we want to use um, for this purpose. And as we heard last week, um, there's good data that shows that some places at least that EAPs are not always um, well used and um, one study that showed them not necessarily well used in the time of a crisis. Um, and so that's not to say it can't happen and that it's not a good solution, but rather that we know you all as a community are thinking that through. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into the conversation. Um, I will go ahead and share my agenda, which um, our agenda here for you today. Let me just do that quickly. So we will um, discuss um, the EAP programs in the time of COVID and um, we'll go till about um, 1240 or maybe 1245 here. And today we have with us, um, let's see, we've got Alina Mayo and Center Care on the line, um, Sharon Sinclair from Alina, Tanya Lindquist Flegel from Center Care, from Center Care, and Mark Hyde of Mayo. Thank you all for being here, and others on the line who will contribute to the conversation. Um, I'm going to start out with um, Sharon from Alina. Um, if you would begin and um, take maybe about five minutes or so to share what you're doing um, and so that we can allow time for people to have questions to ask you um, about about your work as well. Are you fine with that, Sharon? I'm fine with that, Tani. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank so, you. My name is Sharon Sinclair and probably I'm new to these calls, so a lot of you don't know me. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist by profession. I've been leading the Employee Assistance Program for Alina Health for a good long time. Um, and our program is um, what we've described over the years as a wraparound. We have a large national vendor who provides a lot of our EAP services, and then there is a small internal component as well. So just so you know a little bit about what kind of animal we're talking about. Um, so um, I would say, um, I. <laughs> Is EAP the tool we want to use here? <laughs> That's, what a good question you pose, Sarah. Um, and, and of course, my assumption would always be that it is, right? <laughs> so, um, and we're using it in a number of different ways, I'd say. Um, and uh, so our national vendor has provided us with a lot of wonderful materials that we can have available for staff anywhere from videos to webinars to a free phone app that is around um, mood tracking and developing coping tools um, critical incident response services that they offer are morphing a little bit into more of a telephonic than a face-to-face -face model so that is available too. Um, 
just um, my role. Uh, my my role. It's uh, oh dear. It sounds a little odd, I suppose, but my role is a little bit to be the the face of EAP, um, and so it's interesting to try to do that right now because of social distancing and because of um, I'm I'm not as able to move around as freely as I used to be able to, um, and and to really appear. So I am trying to do rounding a little bit myself uh, with leadership to try to understand are there particular places where are there, there are particular issues that we could address through EAP. Um, some of that's being done telephonically and some of that I am frankly trying to figure out what it is going to look like. Um, I think I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, yes. So the thing about Alina Health is that we have a lot of potential sources of support for our staff. We have a mental health service line. We have an integrative medicine function. Um, we have an active spiritual care department. Um, and we have um, other people who are simply um, interested in uh, whole person care for you is how we talk about it a little bit within Alina Health. So how do we encourage self-care among our workforce? Um, so the other thing that is um, a part of, uh, of being in Alina right now, being in this situation is Working collaboratively, oh, our benefits uh, function has a well-being component also. So working collaboratively with all those areas and, and trying to see that we're moving a bit in the same direction rather than all moving in differing directions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We've got a set of... Uh, messages to go out daily to our workforce in email that have been developed. That's one example mm -hmm. of a way that we're trying to pull together a lot of different functions and present something that's a little bit coordinated or cohesive to our workforce. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I think I'll stop. And uh, yeah. if somebody wants to ask me something, please, please do. Thank you, Sharon. You know, I'll start off. You mentioned um, that you've been, it sounds like the physical face of EAP to remind people of that service and that it's challenging to switch that up now in this time. Um, are you doing things, you mentioned about, you know, doing things, um, sounds like, um, in the physical space. Are you doing things virtually to change up how you promote it? Are you finding anything, have you found things that tend to help promote it and actually help people use it? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, virtual promotion right now is happening through our intranet, um, I would say sure. probably mostly. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, and, and whether we'll, <laughs> Whether we're having increased utilization, I won't know for a while yet. Right. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. a lag there. But um, I think we're doing more than usual, uh, I'd say, to hold up the fact that the EAP is here and available for people, um, mm -hmm. given, sure. you know, given the circumstances of the time. Sure. Thank you. Other questions for Sharon? Uh, this is Scott Yarosh from UCARE, and in full disclosure, I'm uh, half UCARE and half uh, my own independent practice, uh, which offers a little bit of a different perspective than larger organizations. But uh, one of the things that's been talked about nationally is that uh, part of the reason why we've had a challenge responding to this in the first place is there have been kind of large bureaucratic barriers you know, through the federal government and otherwise and CMS and so on and so forth. And I think that it's important as it trickles down to us at a local level that we do whatever we can in order to remove 
some of those bureaucratic barriers, such as like who's eligible to, um, you know, to, to use EAP, et cetera. Um, I think we have to be more nimble overall. I'm a member of a, a COVID group, uh, Minnesota Physicians, and uh, have offered to some time for people who might want to chat. And I've had several responses to it. And the ability to act quickly and turn on a dime is very useful. And I think that organizations need to uh, work toward doing that and becoming more agile, uh, which I think is part of the problem. Hi, Dr. Yarosh. How are you? <laughs> we I'm good. Knew How are each you? Other years ago. I'm fine. Thanks. And, uh, yeah, of you, course. Yeah. And a I, long time ago. Yes, a very long time ago. Yeah, well, and I'm I old. I've been doing this for a long time. So, I, you know, we've been having a conversation actually this week and last about exactly what you're talking about in terms of what can we create for specific segments of our population who may need some support? Um, and does that look like some kind of a phone call that we have periodically? Does it look like people offering, as you mentioned, offering chat or offering times? Um, and, and I don't think we're quite to the place yet where we know what we are actually going to do, but it's really an interesting, it's really an interesting question to offer because we do have this immensely rich resource within a line of health. There's just a lot of people who have skills to offer. This so is Sarah. I'm gonna jump in, sorry, that we are going to next week. Our topic is exactly that. Of all of the different interventions that you can offer, how do you identify the different populations and what would go well with what before we go on to the next um, EAP presenter? Sarah? This is Sarah uh, also. I just wanna uh, really appreciate Dr. both both of uh, all of this conversation, but Dr. Yorosh, you bring up so well that as we think of the experience we want to create, you bring up barriers. And when you know what you want to do um, and you're kind of narrowing it down as you're teasing out if it's the right solution, so important to understand both the barriers to getting there and the facilitators and just pausing and being very honest about what those, because even as much as we're in crisis right now, we do bring those things forward with us. So thank you for um, bringing that uh, thoughtful point up. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. And I think that just to underscore it one more time, I think, unfortunately, when you look at systems, and I've worked in systems, I work in a system at UCARE, I have an Alina, and I'm in my own small practice, which is a different kind of a system, that sometimes barriers are, are artificially erected. And in a time like this, we have to look in the mirror and say, well, what barrier does that really serve? And there'd be no other impetus to look at that unless there were a crisis of this magnitude to force people to think about things differently. Because let's face it, we don't want to do things differently. We want to stay the same. That's the whole point of psychotherapy is to try to help people uh, overcome their own internal barriers to wanting to change. That's, yeah, thank you. that's a helpful point. Um, we, at ICSI, we refer to those as sacred orthodoxies or entrenched mental models. And there's, this is really the time to challenge those. <laughs> That's right. Uh, excuse okay. me, I, I, speak, I, I speak in peasant English. <laughs> it's our so way of doing things. Yeah. So good. Um, thank you, uh, Sheila, very much for um, sharing a little bit about the work going on at Alina. Um, and so going now to um, Tanya at Centricare. Please go ahead. Hi. My name is Tanya Lindquist Flegel. I am the wellness specialist at Centric Care Health. And right now we are um, relying a lot on our EAP program to be our key component of employee well being. Um, so we are working with our vendor, and they are providing us lots of different resources that we're able to post on an employee resource page that we're working on right now. Um, something that we are keeping in mind and that we're kind of working through right now is making sure that our employee resource page is accessible for those who are currently furloughed um, or at home right now. Um, and so our internet isn't always the most accessible um, 
method of getting that communication out to employees if they don't have access to work from home. So um, that has been something that we are working through right now. Our EAP vendor is um, reaching out to all of our furloughed staff and doing outreach calls to them connecting them um, to somebody that they can talk to, making sure that they're aware of the resources that are available to them. And a big key component with our EAP service is that our um, EAP program is available to employees and their family members. And so making sure that they're doing that outreach to those who are currently not working right now. And then as things change, we will be sending weekly files to our provider um, so that they can update their outreach services from there too. I'm also working on getting contact cards out to all of our leadership throughout all of our center care locations. Um, this will include a memo that indicates leaders are encouraged to make sure employees have our vendor contact information with them at all times. Um, we are working on an employee letter that will be going out this week that um, uh, mentions all of the services that are available to employees but also reiterates our EAP um, option that's available to them. So it does indicate other services such as our employee health services, our spiritual care departments, um, and then we are also doing daily messages in our daily newsletters that are going out to our employees that reminds them of the different topics and the different ways that our EAP vendor may be utilized. And so making sure that they're um, being in the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, we are going to be receiving weekly reports from our vendor. And so I have, um, I've asked them to use you know, February or January as kind of our base month, you know, prior to all of the COVID stuff starting, utilizing those numbers as our base numbers so that we're able to see week by week any upticks. And so we're able to see then what happened in our area that week that might have shown a larger uptick or a slower um, usage of their services mm -hmm. and making sure that we are utilizing them as feedback so that we can hear what our employees talking about, what are they needing, making sure that the resources that we're providing are what employees are asking for when they're calling in for those services so we can alter that. And the reason why we're utilizing REAP service so much for this is um, we have a really high utilization rate with our vendor already. So our utilization rate is 32%, which is way higher than the national standard. Um, and so that is really exciting for us. They already do outreach for us, even non, not during these times. Um, so that's really helped to make sure that our employees are aware and comfortable with them. Um, and so that's, that's exciting to see that our employees are utilizing it. And so I'm, I'm anxious to see how that changes over the next few weeks here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tanya. Um, mm -hmm. It's really cool that you're not only getting that data to watch closely, is it being used more? And to, I'm sure to understand how, if not, how can we you know, get it used more? Um, but also using that to get feedback on the other in interventions or resources that you offer, are those meeting the needs or is there something else yeah. that's needed? That is that is wise to Sarah's word earlier about, you know, taking knowledge, but then getting it to wisdom. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a smart move. Um, one of the things that was mentioned last week um, by Lisa at Centric Care was also that um, at the executive level, um, messaging how we all are human. We all have times where we mm -hmm. need and this is what EAP is for um, and and so I thought that too was a good um, example of how to help promote that service. Other questions for Tanya? Um, hi this is Jen Insinger I'm with the Fairview Employee Assistance Program and I do have a question Tanya you had mentioned that you're sending out daily messages and I just wondered what vehicle you're using if, if that's something that Centric Care allows for just mass emails. Um, you know, kind of how are you getting that daily message to the employees? So we have a daily newsletter that goes out already to our employees called the Daily Dose. 
And that is where all communication throughout center care is encouraged to go through. Um, and so right now it is definitely filled with a lot of different COVID information, um, PPE information. And, um, and so that's really where employees are going to find their information. And so being able to have a static uh, message you know, top right, very visible on that newsletter is where where we're putting these messages and making sure to have a variety of them and rotating through them so that we can give employees a perspective as to, oh, maybe I didn't think of it that way. And maybe I would like to have somebody to talk to about that. Or maybe, you know, also encouraging family members to reach out too, because, you know, maybe the employee's okay, but the spouse is really having a hard time with the employee workload or um, taking care of the children at home, making sure we incorporate those things too. Great, thank you. You're welcome. This is Sarah. I just want to comment, uh, you know, isn't, I, I love the positioning of that, where they go to find out how to protect themselves physically. And in the exact same communication is how to care for themselves um, in terms of mental health. I think that's a really powerful um, combination. Awesome. Thank you. So this is Jody from ICSI. I have two questions. One, um, in terms of the feedback, are you getting feedback from people who are using the service or feedback from the other 70% who are not using the service? That's one question. I'll stop. So we have two different ways where we'll be getting that information from. Um, in the employee letter that'll be going out this week and also published on our employee resource page is an email and phone number for our COVID staff support response team committee. And so employees are able to utilize that contact information as a way to reach out to us and say, I see that you have this information posted, but I think this might be more helpful, or I'm really having trouble with this. Maybe you have some tips on how to overcome these other issues. And so utilizing feedback that way, and then also utilizing from um, our EAP vendor, being able to say, wow, you know, 10% of our calls this week have been on this topic. And for us to then say, well, yeah, we don't have any of that posted out there right now. So let's make sure that we utilize um, our, our resources and definitely utilizing, we wanna utilize our internal resources as well. So, um, you know, talking to our internal med providers or um, our health coaches and being able to incorporate some resources from them as well. So really getting it from both and providing contact information for both. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are going to, if you have more questions for Tanya, please chat them in. I did see there was another question for Sharon. Um, so we'll be sure to get that question to you, Sharon. Um, but I also wanna make the space and time here. Um, we have also Mark Hyde from Mayo on the line. Um, and so thank you, Mark, for being with us. I you're by phone, I believe. Yes, and I apologize. I couldn't get the computer to work properly, so I am uh, on the phone. That's, and, you're here, uh, that's the conversation. good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to join, and thanks for asking. Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick um, overview of, of the Rochester, Minnesota EAP. I've managed that program for over 21 years now, and we're an internal EAP, uh, myself and five full-time professional-level counselors on site who do 90% of direct face-to-face -face, uh, counsel, uh, guidance and counsel with our employees. And so, you know, when we looked at this issue, the first thing that we always do is our services are kind of in two broad categories. We have employee services, individual counsel services that are really traditional mainline EAP work, as we all know what that is, assessing, support, uh, short-term problem solving, domestic family, mental health, all those issues, maybe triage, as need or work with primary care providers or community as well on other needs uh, with our clients. Um, but we do about 80% that we can certainly manage in-house and be able to manage their need and a smaller percent would need to be externally referred out. So we looked at how many things we could do inside with our employees. And we also look at our other category, which is really, I think, a huge focus here for us as an internal EAP, our organizational services. And that means working with HR leadership where we impact large groups of people. It could be a few employees or it could be 
whole group of employees, meaning the consults, meeting with HR and leadership about a wide array of employee behavioral issues in the workplace, whether it's teamwork, conflict, communication, um, dealing with change, work culture change, all of these things that we do all the time. So we looked at those two areas and I'll run through a couple of the targeted things we've tried to do with our employees directly first. With our employees, we've, we've gone to a a tele model, of course, for safety as well, and um, but a tele model, which means for us that we can increase the volume of people that we see because we're doing a little shorter than those hour plus visits, uh, thirty-minute sessions. We can increase our volume twofold if we absolutely need to. So far, we're running par with what we've done before. The difference is ninety percent of the calls are now COVID-related in some way. So our direct sessions are all about COVID, either fear, anxiety, mental health, domestic, family, work-related issues. So a lot of counselor problem solving and being internal were heavily ingrained in the fabric of leadership, HR, policy procedures, and other groups to try to help our employees navigate some of those issues. Um, we've, we've created a video just recently uh, as well with our media services about a three, four minute video that will go out on a distribution list and will go out through other mail venues for employees uh, next late this week, probably about tips for caring for yourself. Um, we created a document early on, of course, that went on our external website, EAP, an internal one about everything from social distancing to information management to apps and articles about emotional issues, mindfulness, caring for yourself, all of those things. Um, and of course, specific information that we tried for any employee that's quarantined in any way, either for a, a positive being affected or quarantined because they've been exposed and are quarantined waiting that 14 day period. Um, a lot of concern there by people, of course, the wellness of individuals that are quarantined. So we're making sure we have information that's distributed them distributed to those employees when they're taken off and quarantined by OCK or uh, Occupational Health uh, has our information into their hands, a paper copy that also leads to a lot of electronic kind of resources. Um, there's just a few things really quickly for employees. Um, the, the management side of this, I should mention on the employee side is our biggest challenge is trying to normalize, not pathologize. And I think that's the real challenge for the behavioral folks in all venues, EAP providers, everywhere because people are seeing, of course, a different internal uh, cognitive process and then how people emote. And those are different than what we see widespread. However, we would all say the majority of those are probably going to be normal in response to the situation. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be really, really important as EAPs try to sort out the behavioral health care about how they're responding to all of these referrals and these needed issues that people will believe are needed issues in the workplace. We're already getting calls about debriefings um, and we're not quite there yet to be able to say how do we work with leadership about responding to all the employee issues that are going to come their way and the volume that's going to come their way. We're doing some targeted work with leadership to be able to, we sent the video that will go out um, in another day to leadership about how to manage COVID related issues with employees in the workplace. Um, articles for them as well. Uh, on our large uh, EAP web or our large website that goes out to all employees, there'll be some more for leadership only. We have a distribution list for managers who have just seen our leadership talks that I do on the staff about a wide variety of employee organizational issues in the workplace. So we have a few thousand people on that list that we can target an ICU, ED, and other areas that we plan on hitting specifically in the next week or two about some of the resources in EAP, other areas, as well as how we can help them with consults as they deal with just a wide array of, of issues and maybe a warm hotline to us, um, which we do all the time anyway, just about what do I do with this? Here's a situation that came my, came my way. What do I do with this employee? So a lot of management work that we will do because we, that will be the kind of the turning point about where employees will go Will they get to primary care right away? Will they go to EAP? Will they go to psychiatry? So there's a lot of help and leadership there about where to triage and send people or encourage them resource-wise. Um, the other thing I'll mention really fast and then I'll be done is um, leave time for questions, but we've got a large group caring for your staff initiative and thank goodness because we want to keep our EAP people where we think we're going to need them the most in-house, which is dealing with 
mental health issues, dealing with those phone sessions, and deal with our leaders who every day send emails and call. This group is made up of chaplain services, department of psychiatry, any different physicians, leaders, IT people. Um, we've got people doing peer support trainings, people trying to do more psychological first aid training directly with frontline people. That initiative has been huge for us. There's about 30,000 plus people on the campus. And so that is really helpful. It allows me to have EAP programming for targeted areas, partnership with all those groups, but allow them to do so many frontline things with peers and support that, that allows us to do our other piece behind the scenes with employees directly and with management. I said a lot in a short period of time, so I'll be quiet. Thank you, Mark. Okay, do, do we have questions for Mark? I think there's some questions on the chat. Jody, do you have those? Yeah, I do. Um, first question is, has EAP been internal throughout your tenure? Um, are you aware of more trust or more suspicion from employees in this COVID era? Um, uh, yes, we've been internal for over 30 some years and I've been there 21 years and, and the decade before me was internal. The uh, program grew in the last uh, uh, 15 years. We've added staff and we've changed program and initiatives a little broader. Um, the, the trust, I'm not sure what the question is directly, but the concerns are, are more related to, again, that we're seeing 90% of our calls. The traditional calls before were always about you know, workplace issues, mental health issues, family issues, those three, and they kind of mix up most EAPs across the nation. Those are the top three. Uh, now they're related to those, but with COVID. So the concerns are about having to float to different areas, exposure, year, uh, hours. Uh, my spouse is now watching the kids overnight. Um, uh, I can't be home at normal times. What do I do with this need or that need domestically? So I'm not sure what the trust issue, but m more related to just the, the trust of being able to get everything done at home and at work and the fear. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, I know there will be more questions and there are in the chat than even we can get to. Um, one I'm going to call out, and this is to all of you, um, whether one of the presenters or otherwise. Um, one of the questions from Willie Garrett, president of the Minnesota Psychological Association. How, yeah, hi, good to meet you. Um, how are you addressing cultural competence through your EAP services? Do you pro provide different, you know, some different service um, for people of different ethnicities? No, if, uh, this is Mark again, if it's for okay. me, I'm not sure, but no, no we, we yeah, provide the services. Okay, gotcha. But for us, we provide services to anyone, no matter who they are. We don't have a specific, we don't have bilingual counselors on staff community. We do, if somebody wants something specific, mm -hmm. we tr try to resource them to the community. Sure. Tanya, this is one more, I think, important question. And since I'm doing the next part, I'm gonna, I can cut my part short for a second. Sure. Um, uh, for Mark and, and others who are doing this, how are you teaching psychological first aid? The online six hour program is overwhelmed as to be unusable. Yeah, Mayo, the other group, not EAP, but another group has offered to do that. And they just completed a video uh, training on that, that they're dispersing out across our sites to people. Uh, it's a video about what is psychological first aid and how do you use that. And then there's also a wide variety of people that have been trained, the trainers, and um, I believe they're trying to do as much as they can in the moment as well. Okay. So um, I would encourage all of you um, to chat in any questions you have about EAP to you know one another. We can capture them and share that through um, through our responses back to you. Okay, that would be fabulous. Um, and. Uh, we're going to move to a quick update on um, some the website and some resources that we're collecting through you, not only links, but really getting down to some of the practicalities, the policies, the structures, the things that you're changing to be able to share with one another. Um, so we're going to go quickly to that, Jody, as Jody mentioned, and then um, we'll leave a good five minutes because we have some updates from some of our group members here that we want to give them time for. So are you going to share your screen, Jody, or should I do mine? If you could do it, that would be great. I think I have it up. Just one moment. 
That's okay, Tani. I have it. I can. Show oh, you do. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I deleted the first grade math problem that I could not solve this morning. So, okay, <laughs> just to this. So, um, this is the website. We showed it last week, but wanted to show it again. And there's two really main parts of it. Um, the first part is, try to get that up. There we go. System support for healthcare workers. And I, I will give my bias. I think this is the more important part, particularly because I think a lot of you have already worked on and your EAP programs are doing it. It's in social media, this kind of self directed support, you know, apps, tips, blogs, places they can go. Important. Um, but I think that you all have already done a really great job of providing that. So happy to populate that. But I think the system support, so how, what we can do within and put in place to make it easy that, that providers or other workers don't have to go out and ask for it. I think those are the things we really wanna populate on this site. And so to that extent, we've developed this framework and I'll review it one more time because we wanna make sure it's the right framework of areas within it that we can populate. So the first one was planning and infrastructure. So we thought that kind of the resources that we discussed today at EAP could go in here. EAP is part of the infrastructure that you use to get out resources to your healthcare workforce. Um, then we have a few other links here for that are helpful, more broad macro as a system, what you can do. Then we put in training um, and psychological first aid is the obvious one that we all have been talking about, but hopefully there are others. And what I think would be helpful is to understand what are you all doing with this? So who are you asking to be trained? Is it just offering it to people? Is it you know, assigning certain of your workforce to be trained in it so that they could support. What are really the mechanisms? How is this being used? Um, and so I think, you know, extending this beyond, here's the training to what are you all doing with it would be really helpful. We have a section for counseling. And so these are some kind of general text lines. I know Hennepin had talked about having their own healthcare um, line for their workers. And so other things you all are doing around counseling or whether you're having telehealth appointments that you're offering, um, those examples would be really useful. Assisting with basic needs. So this is the sleep, the food, the exercise, the respite rooms. Um, you know, what are we doing? So that's nothing that a worker has to ask for, but to Tani's point of there's no coffee maker, but how can you provide food in some fashion or give a certificate of food? Or, or what are the kind of innovative solutions we're doing to come up with assisting workers in basic needs? Um, and then support groups. There have been talk about buddy systems, town halls. These are the things we would like to populate in this section. And so really our ask of you today um, is to send us this information. And we recognize um, if you don't wanna give full detail and you know, your organization doesn't give you permission to share all, that's okay. If you give us one or two sentences and then we can give your contact name and people can contact you. But we really think these vignettes, these stories is what's gonna really make this site different and be the most helpful in real time. What are you doing? How can somebody replicate it? At ICSI, we say steal with zeal. I mean, this is not the time for us to kind of worry about that, but so how can we help you do that easily? Um, so Tani sent her email and sent a couple of things. We would love to hear about it, but honestly, if you want to talk on the phone and we can write up a couple sentences, we're happy to do that too. I mean, this is supposed to be useful, quick, um, and I think we're good at, at getting to that. So however we can help you, populate this, we're happy to do so. And then the self-directed support, happy to keep populating with things you guys get. I'm really mindful that there, it's overwhelming for people to get a ton of information. They're getting it in every aspect of their life. And so we're trying to curate, um, if we hear a few people say a site's good, we're putting it up there, but trying to keep that a little bit more limited as I'm sure your EAP programs are probably trying to do the same. With that, I will try to, I will end and see if there's any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jody, um, And thank you all who are chatting in um, different questions and comments and resources, both about psychological first aid as came up, but also about EAP. Um, there's one key question about EH, EAP, going back to that around, um, do physicians use EAP? And, um, and let me find the question, and what would ways be to increase that? So the EAP conversation, there's some 
challenges with it that we want to continue to suss out. Um, and so we will send these questions to you via email and ask for some thoughts that way. Um, and certainly revisit this um, as needed in, in the coming weeks. Um, so keep those questions coming in here. That allows us to curate them and make sure we follow up on them. Um, so with that, we're going to jump to updates from the community, from all of you. Um, Linda Vukalic, um, I will hand the microphone over to you if you'd be so kind to share a little bit about some new work that you and others in the community are doing. Sure. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Um, I've been working with, um, with Shanna at the Mental Health Association and also uh, Tricia and Willie with the Minnesota Psychological Association, and we have developed um, uh, where we're working on actually a volunteer service that is basically a special service of support for mental or for uh, all healthcare providers, first responders, and essential employees. And we just want to um, we're using Fast Tracker. If you're not familiar with that, Fast Tracker is our online database, and it's a referral uh, network so that people can go online both mental health and substance use disorder treatment resources. It's fasttrackermn.org. And we're gonna add COVID cares. It's basically what we're calling this service, which is um, one-time support services, 20 minutes or so uh, provided by volunteer uh, mental health and substance use professionals and um, offering you know, whatever people are needing in terms of support for um, you know, self-care strategies, um, helping them find resources, referrals, just listening and support, just sort of somebody who um, is trained to have that sensitive ear. And maybe they're not somebody that they're gonna run into in the hallway tomorrow, but there's somebody who understands their situation. And we're trying to get volunteers, so we're coming to you today to see if you could help us publicize the call for volunteers and to get the word out to the people who are working in your system to help us uh, help them. And I think that that's pretty much it. Basically, we're hoping to go live on Monday. So this just came up a week ago. And as you know, the, the speed of change during this particular time has been you know, amazing. And hopefully, we'll be able to, to pull it off. And with your help, I hope we can. Do any of my partners want to add anything? Thank you, Linda. Love that example of, again, quickly galvanizing to um, fill a gap um, and bringing together both that warm line concept and connection to resources. So thank you to all of you. Um, other, detail, other updates from anyone in the community that you would like to share? There's a lot of work going on. And so, um, so one of the things for next week, me being that we're getting to the top of the hour, for next week, I'm gonna reach out to a few of you. You might have a hunch who you are, or if you think this fits for you, let me know um, to populate a conversation on um, further stratifying and determining the right intervention for the right population. That came up in both of our first two conversations. You know, when is EAP the right resource? When does something need to be specifically offered for physicians? Is there something different for IT staff, those lab techs who are nervous handling their um, the blood samples or furloughed employees? Um, so we, we've heard tantalizing bits from a few folks on what they're doing there, really rich stuff. Um, and so we'll have more conversation on that next week. Uh, also, by the level of questions here, we may have a EAP part two in a few weeks as well, um, but there are other um, topics that you all have raised that we'll want to get to as well. So thank you all. Uh, Johnny, yes. Johnny, Johnny, sorry, just want Johnny, to say thank you. Um, uh, we'll send a link for this, but there's an echo offer on Thursday oh, thank you. on psychological first aid. So really important, could be really useful. We'll pass along that link yep. to you all. Thanks for the reminder, Jody. Excellent, good. Thank you all. We're gonna leave this chat open for a little bit. If you've got some last minute things to chat in here, you wanna make sure the question gets on the radar or a hot topic that you wanna discuss, um, get it in here and we'll um, put a pin in it, bring it forward later. Bye all, thank you.